Thank you very much, and I apologize for the really uncatchy title of this presentation. Um, I also feel like right now some yoga, some mindfulness would go down quite well, um, given the size of this room, but hopefully you can bear with me. So I'm a, an outcomes researcher based at Roche, um, and today I'm going to talk to you about some of the data we have from one of our clinical trials, but the focus is, is really about quality of life. Um, I'm always fascinated to see how interventions impact outcomes, but of course what really matters is how interventions impact people's day-to-day -day lives, how they feel, how they function. So that's the focus of my talk today. Um, just like to disclose a few financial disclosures. Uh, myself and a number of my co-workers um, or co-authors uh, work for Roche. Um, the study was sponsored by Roche. Um, and most importantly, I'd like to thank all the participants. Um, for those of you that work in research, you'll know that running a study is incredibly painful when it comes to the amount of time, effort, um, and collab collaboration that's required. So I want to thank all the families, the individuals, um, the investigators that contributed to this study, and you can just see a list of some of the folks who were involved. So this will not be a surprise to any of you in the room. We all are very aware that um, the core characteristics of autism include social communication and social interaction challenges, as well as restricted repetitive pat patterns of behavior. Uh, and of course, there are a number of associated characteristics you can see on the screen here. Um, there's also a, a really growing body of evidence to indicate that uh, for some individuals, an autism diagnosis can impact upon other aspects of health-related quality of life. Now, we know that there are some medications that currently exist for some of these associated characteristics and conditions. Um, and of course, that varies by country. Uh, many of these are only available in the US, for example. Um, but we also know that there are currently no medications that have been developed to target the core characteristics of autism spectrum disorder. Now, there are a number of different hypotheses, different development routes that are being explored in this field, and that's been going on for several decades. But one really interesting um, hypothesis is around the role of vasopressin um, in moderating symptoms of autism. So vasopressin is, is complex and has multiple functions and plays a number of important roles in the brain and in the body. Um, but we also know that it's linked to social behavior and to stress. Um, and there's research to suggest that blocking vasopressin receptors has effects that may result in improvements in social behaviors. And of course, there is therefore a hypothesis that in moderating vasopressin, this could have the potential uh, to help improve social and communication challenges. So at Roche, we've been developing a new molecule called Balavaptan. Um, it's a vasopressin receptor antagonist, um, and we're currently exploring it in, in a number of clinical trials. Uh, the vanilla study that I'm going to share with you today was the first phase two study investigating Balavaptan um, for people with autism. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background to the study before I show you the, the data, which is obviously the most interesting part. Um, so, this study involved 223 adult men with moderate to severe symptoms of autism in the U.S. Uh, you can see the, the median age as well as the fact that these individuals all had an IQ above 70. And some of you may ask why such a specific population, uh, as we've heard already today, um, there is so much heterogeneity that it helps for us as researchers to try and focus on a particular population before exploring further. Um, this was a complex study design. It included looking at placebo, so no treatment, uh, versus different doses of this balavaptan molecule, uh, 1.5, 4, and 10 milligrams. Um, and this was a, a safety and efficacy study, so we explored the impact upon socialization and communication, uh, but also looked at safety and tolerability, and importantly, quality of life. So let me just give you the, the key results before I show you some of the quality of life data. Um, so our primary endpoint was the SRS2. Um, we saw improvements both on balavaptan and placebo, and that's something that's been observed in other trials using the SRS2 where there is um, a strong placebo response. However, we did see improvements on the violent adaptive behavior scales that were statistically significant and clinically meaningful um, using the balavaptan uh, 10 milligram dose over the 12 week period. But most importantly, there were no emerging safety concerns, and balavaptan was well tolerated across 
all doses. Um, and this slide just shows you the incident of um, adverse events and serious adverse events and withdrawal due to adverse events. And you can see that it's very consistent across the placebo arm as well as the treatment arms. So I, I said that I was going to talk about quality of life. And let me just tell you a little bit about some of the scales that we used in this study. So we measured health-related quality of life using the PEDSQL uh, generic core scale. Um, now, this is a frustrating name in that it's called the PEDSQL, but it actually has adult and young adult um, available uh, versions that we use in our studies. So it's been validated in, in adults with, with autism. Um, it measures emotional functioning, social functioning, and physical and work functioning. Uh, and we employed the self-report version of this scale. We also explored cognitive functioning using a really brief module of the PEDSQL, um, again, a self-report adult-specific version. Uh, and we also looked at family impact using the, the PEDSQL family impact module. This is a, a much bigger scale that looks at impact upon um, immediate family members, the broader family, and takes into account quality of life as well as impacts on function, finances, etc. So at baseline, there was a, a very consistent uh, mean score across the different treatment groups, and you can see that here. And let me tell you a bit about some of the data. So for the, for the health-related quality of life using this generic core scale, um, we saw a really nice response over the 12-week treatment period. Um, so this was statistically significant, but also clinically meaningful. So we, we, we know there are a number of estimates of minimal clinically important difference that are, are available, and this exceeded that threshold. Um, interestingly, we also saw the efficacy continue after the end of treatment, so six weeks following the 12-week treatment period. When we look at cognitive functioning, we also saw um, improvements in cognitive functioning versus placebo, um, but it's worth saying that these were exploratory analyses, and so the p-values are very nominal. And finally, looking at the, the PEDSQL family impact module, so it's fair to say that there was no differences observed between valabaptan and placebo uh, on the impacts on family and caregivers. Um, one thing I did want to just highlight, because um, I'm slightly ahead of time, which I'm surprised about, is um, the, obviously the PEDSQL core module includes lots of different domains of health-related quality of life. What I'm showing here is focused on the total score, which incorporates everything. Um, when we looked at the data, it was very clear that the, the socio-economic elements were the, the ones that we saw the most improvement on. So social function, emotional well-being, um, and work, our educational function. So that was quite an interesting observation. So to conclude, um, the, the vanilla study showed that balavaptam was well tolerated. Uh, there were no um, safety observations. Uh, and we also saw that there were improvements over placebo in both socialization and communication uh, as assessed by the, the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scales. Um, we also showed that there was a clinically meaningful improvement in health-related quality of life using the 10 milligram dose versus placebo. Um, again, this was specific to, to adult males um, in the US. Um, and that really just highlights the, the challenge of clinical development. So, we have a number of ongoing and future studies um, that are looking to see whether we can replicate these findings in different populations. Uh, we have a, a study called Aviation, which is a phase two study um, in children aged from five to 17, uh, again in the US. Uh, that includes both males and females. And we also have a phase three study called Viaduct, which is currently enrolling um, both in Europe and in North America, um, which is again an adult study, but in both males and females. So we hope to see if we can replicate these findings in additional studies. And that's everything. Thank you very much for your attention.